Thank you. Uh, this being TEDx, I thought I'd try this barefoot. And <laughs> this is the first talk I've ever given barefoot. Right? Um, so I thought I'd introduce myself by showing you my uh, favorite cartoon. This is uh, uh, Eat, Survive, Reproduce. Eat, Survive, Reproduce. For some of you, thinks, well, look at that. Aren't we great? We have a big brain. We can ask a question that no other species can ask. Others of us say, wow, look at that. We're so stupid that we're asking a question that everybody else knows the answer to. <laughs> Now, this is where I live. This is one of the, big, the deepest pictures ever taken of the universe. If you could see through this ceiling and beyond the beautiful sun that we have, you would see um, stars like that. But on this image, there are only a few stars. Every single spot there is a galaxy. And a galaxy has, these are galaxies on average have about 100 billion stars. And so this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the sky. It's like holding your pinky up and looking with the deepest telescope you can through that pinky. That's exactly what you would see. Now, so this is where I live. And I, I should start, introduce myself by saying that when I was in high school and college, I had a tremendous identity crisis. And I was trying to figure out who I was and what it meant to be a human being. And so I ended up start. I studied English and I studied history. I traveled around the world a lot. And then I ended up studying physics, I think, because physics was something that I could do no matter where I was. If I studied history, I would be studying American history or European history. And I couldn't do that in Brazil or China or the North Pole. But if you study physics, you're qualified to practice physics, probably in Alpha Centauri, if we ever get there. Now, so those are just one of the places where I live. I should notice also that I did my PhD in the, I did it on the microwave background radiation. These are the oldest photons you can see. And if you looked beyond these visible images, you would see the microwave background. These are the photons from about 13.8 billion years old. Now, when you look out, part of my job is a, as a convener of the Planetary Science Institute today, and you, is to try to figure out, are there any other Earths out there? What fraction of the stars that you can see there have planets orbiting around them? And I should say that just the, recently, in the last few years, it looks like the best evidence we have strongly suggests that every single star that you see out there has some type of planetary system around it. In fact, more speculatively, Maybe it looks somewhat good evidence that every single star might have a rocky planet in the habitable zone where you can have liquid water at the surface. So that's good news for all you rocket builders who want to have a destination to go to. <laughs> now, there's one other thing about outer space besides being really big, and that is we would like to know if we are the only life, we terrestrial life forms are the only life in the universe. And more specifically, for people who are bored by bacteria, we would like to know if we're the only intelligent life forms in the universe. That's what most of us are interested in. I think it's because we want some godlike intelligence to solve our problems. Our physicists want to solve the physics problems, and so we think of extraterrestrials as being all-knowing, and maybe they can help us out. Um, now, I want to show the next slide here. Hello out there. Is there life elsewhere, and is there intelligent life elsewhere? Now, because we don't have any evidence, firm evidence, for extraterrestrials, we have to try to do what we can with the evidence available to us. And the idea worth spreading is that here on Earth, we have some evidence that can help us address this problem. And uh, that's what I want to talk about today. So, this is a colleague, of, his name is Enrico Fermi, a famous physicist, and about 60, 70 years ago, he asked the question, where is everybody? Now, why did he ask that? What does that mean? Here's his logic. He knew that we live in a galaxy, like the one on the left, from here to here, from one side to the other, is 100,000 light years. Traveling at the speed of light, it takes 100,000 years to go, the, go across. I should back up and say, if you're traveling at the speed of light, time doesn't go by, so you can get there instantly, back and forth and back and forth. But, that's, but not if you're not traveling. Anyway, <laughs> so if you travel back and forth and back and forth, you at, at about 10% the speed of light, which is not too far beyond what we can already do, then you could have traveled back and forth during the age of the galaxy 10,000 times. If that's the case, and if there are extraterrestrial civilizations out there, then where is everybody? Why haven't they already colonized Earth? When we look at Earth, we dig up all these wonderful fossils, but we don't find any extraterrestrial spaceships.
We find skulls like that that tell us about our ancestors. When we build radio telescopes and listen in to the extraterrestrials talking to each other, we don't hear anything. It's silence. So the question is, that's why he said, where is everybody? That was the logic that he went through. Now, this is a lovely diagram. It's one of my favorite diagrams. It's created by DNA, a 16S ribosomal RNA, in fact. And you can see up in the left are bacteria. On the right are what you might call a different type of bacteria called archaea. And down in the left are the eukaryotes. That's where we belong. And if you look carefully, it's, you see the word homo, that stands for homo sapiens, and that represents all animals on the planet. And if you look right next to it, you see the word zea, that's corn. That's representing all the plants on the planet. And if you look right next to it, you'll see caprinus, that's a, that's a mushroom, representing all the fungi. So the three major multicellular eukaryotic life forms that you learned about in high school and are learning about are a tiny, tiny fraction of the genetic diversity of life on this planet. Not only that, there's no, there are no viruses included in this diagram. So if you want to know your position in the biosphere, how you relate to other life forms, look at this diagram, spend a long time looking at it. And also the origin of life is right here where it says root, and these are hyperthermophilic bacteria. Now this is a lot of progress that has been made to make this diagram, and I want to show you a diagram that about from about 60 years ago to show you where we were then and a lot of where we are emotionally today. That is this diagram here. <laughs> here we have the origin of life at the bottom and then we have what this is what I call the Schwarzeneggerization of life. <laughs> and at the top you have this muscle building male Caucasian and it's a homo sapien of course and then everything else is kind of derivative and going off to the side and doesn't mean anything, it doesn't matter. Over here, for example, are the plants on the right-hand side, and the mushrooms don't even make an appearance here. <laughs> Not, and, uh, so, the, so the idea that life started to lead to us, or to lead to Arnold Schwarzenegger, is a silly one, and I hope I want, I want to ingrain that in you, because this appeals to our vanity, and that is a powerful, powerful emotional force. And when people, I heard hearing people say, don't think, feel. And I said, no, don't feel, don't feel. If you feel, you will think you're just important. And it's important. <laughs> <laughs> and in, there's one sense that feeling you're important is very important. On the other hand, let's not exaggerate your own self-importance because that turns you into a dick. In <laughs> then I want to show you, I want to de-dickify you here. Is what <laughs> so here's a, Here's a more modern version of a book, and you can see that at the bottom you have some crystals, and that turns into jellyfish, turns into fish, and then turns into a brain. And the book, this is a title of a book, well, the title is The Major Transitions in Evolution. I said, whoa, this is a perfect example of the vanity that I'm trying to cure myself of and, and, every, and the whole world if we can. And the main assumption behind Fermi's paradox, which I mentioned earlier, is that smarter things are selected for. Now, how does that work? Well, let's suppose that you're the two kangaroos. One kangaroo is a smart kangaroo, another kangaroo is a stupid kangaroo, and the smart kangaroo can figure out how to, I don't know, jump over a river or dig up some things, that, a, a new kind of food. A smart kangaroo, somehow smartness is a universal feature that should help this kangaroo find more food and leave more offspring. Dead, the dumb kangaroo dies, doesn't only has two babies instead of 10 over here. And then those 10 have inherited the genes of their mother and father, and therefore, uh, they have bigger brains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the logic of smart is better. And that's the logic with which we think that our adaptation, human-like intelligence, is a universal feature of evolution. And I want to show you evidence that strongly suggests that that's not the case, that that simple logic that seems so obvious is not correct. One thing, <laughs> this false logic I call the fallacy of the planet of the apes. I'm not sure if you know this, there's a Charlton Heston and a group of astronauts are cryogenically in hibernation and their computers go haywire and they crash land on a planet and they don't know where they are. And on this planet, there are four types of apes. There are chimps and gorillas and orangutans and humans that don't know how to speak. And there's also corn and the chimps are speaking English and riding around on horses. And as, now, they claim to be scientists. If they were scientists, they would know that they were on Earth. 
They need some quirkometry regulation here. Whenever you see something like English being spoken anywhere in the galaxy, you should say, that's probably uh, the Earth. <laughs> it, it's only when he saw the half-buried Statue of Liberty that he says, oh, damn it, what have we done? Only this half-buried Statue of Liberty was what cued him off. If he were a biologist, he would have known as soon as he saw corn. Oh, my God, this is Earth. Now, he was also, you know, he, could, he was a human being who could speak, and that kind of unsettled the apes of the planet, and so they locked him up, put a string around him, and gave him a trial, and held him in jail. Uh, now that, but the whole point is that, uh, well, here's the whole point. <laughs> that there is a pyramid, we ha there's an intelligence niche, we humans are at the top. Underneath, you find apes, dogs, sheep, and vertebrates with half a brain. Down below are bacteria, worms, fungi, and stupid things. <laughs> And here we are in the world stage and off stage of the apes. And as soon as I flub up, fall over, uh, have World War III, four, five, or six ecological disasters, then the other apes will say, hey, the intelligence niche is empty. Now we can come on stage and fill it. That's what the Planet of the Apes fallacy is about. And that's crazy. And I want to show you why that's crazy. Although it's worth talking about because it's so easy. It's so beguilingly tempting to our vanity. And that's what Hollywood is all about, isn't it? So... Now, Carl Sagan is one of my mentors, but he, he well, one, this, here's how he described it. There is a human-like intelligence niche. There is selection pressure on other species, including our ancestors, to occupy this niche. In our absence or on other planets, some species will evolve into that niche and develop technology. Carl Sagan has called the occupants of this niche the functional equivalent of homo sapiens, of humans. Now, Everything that Carl Sagan says, I love. He's the reason I do the cosmology, but I have to differ on him about this point. He is a physicist, and physicists somehow think that brains are important. Biologists know that they're not that important. <laughs> now, so here's the, here's the idea. We humans fall down, and then the apes take over, and that's the plan of the apes model. Now, uh, about 10 years ago, I was on a plane with Frank Drake. This is Frank Drake writing his famous Drake equation. And the, number, the letter N there is the number of communicable civilizations in our galaxy with whom we can communicate with current radio technology. And I said to him, Frank, why do you, what do you think is the strongest evidence that there are human-like intelligences or that human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution, that other civilizations will have built radio telescopes? And he said to me, read Harry Jerison. That's what it says up there, read Harry Jerison. So I'd never heard of Harry Jerison, so I looked up Harry Jerison, and this is a plot from one of Jerison's papers. Now, on the x-axis is millions of years ago, 200 million years ago, 100 million years ago, today on the right. And on the y-axis is plotted encephalization quotient, essentially how big your brain is compared to your body. And this guy looked at fossils and fossil brain cases, and he measured all this, and he plotted species on this thing. And he said, look at that. There is a trend here. Therefore, that trend is universal. And I do data analysis for a living, and I said, that's crazy. And as to show you why that's crazy, consider an elephant. Consider an elephant. He looks around, and the elephant says, hey, you know, I'm pretty good. My skin is pretty thick, but rhinos have pretty thick, thick skin too. What is the feature that I have that is an extreme quality? And he says, ah, I have a long, long nose. So let me invent something called the nasalization quotient. That's the ratio of my nose length to my body length. And of course, when you plot that, this is what you get. And the reason why you get that is because you have created a y-axis that puts you now at the top here. That's called a selection bias. <laughs> now, so that's, that's one piece of evidence why this motivation for SETI I don't, is inappropriate. There are other experiments that have been done. And as a matter of fact, half a dozen long-duration experiments in vertebrate evolution have already been tested, have already tested this hypothesis, the Planet of the Apes hypothesis, and found it to be a fallacy. The name of those tests are Madagascar, New Zealand, Australia, South America, and North America. What do I mean? Well, you may know, and this is supposed to help you, show 120 million years ago, this is where the continents were. 60 million years ago, this is where they were. And the present day, that's the configuration of the continents. Continents grow, float around, many of them independent of the other ones. When you are a fairly large landmass and you're independent of the other ones, you are essentially an independent experiment in vertebrate evolution. The other things are not affecting you. 
There are no other things inhabiting the intelligence niche here. So you ask the question, if this intelligence niche does exist, if, it does, if that logic of the smart kangaroo leaving more offspring is legitimate, then on every single one of these independent experiments, you will have seen something getting a big brain, becoming more human-like, and inhabiting that intelligence niche. But when you go around and look at the species that evolved during the 50, 60, 70, 80 million years of independence, you don't see that. I should point out that your brains, which are about this big, developed, they used to be this big, they tripled in size in a period of two to three million years. So two to three million years is the relevant time scale, at least in our case, for getting this big brain that we're so proud of. So how many intervals, there were many, many, many intervals of two to three million years available to these other vertebrates, and when you look at the, what could be considered the smartest thing in New Zealand, <laughs> you... I mean that evolved there, not a placental mammal that it came later. I, I don't even, I'm not talking about placental mammals. I'm talking about things that were there for during this 100 million years of, ind of independence. So there's a tuatara kiwi. And you say, is there any evidence that these two creatures started to evolve towards a, a human-like uh, intelligence? And I think the answer is obviously no. Here in Australia, Australia was drifting independent of other continents for about 100 million years. During that 100 million years, did kangaroos get bigger and bigger brains? Say, hey, now I'm the smartest thing in, in Australia. Remember, before 50 or 60,000 years ago, there were no people here. We're talking about kangaroos being here for 100 million years, 80 million years or so. And they don't, we have no evidence that their brain cases are getting bigger to become more human because, you know, smart is better. So that tells me that there's evidence that no, this human-type smartness is not necessarily better. So, you know, we have New Zealand, we have Australia, we have Madagascar, these are, <laughs> these are ring-tailed lemurs. You know, they are not trying to become human. And this is evidence, this is a test that has already been done. We don't have to think our way into the future, sorry, what will happen? No, these are tests, these are natural experiments that have already been done. South America, same thing, about 100 million years of independence, and these guys are not, these howler monkeys are not trying to be humans. Now, the bottom line is that our closest relatives in the universe are here on Earth, and they are not evolving in the direction of becoming more like us. And I think that's a little bit humbling because, I don't know, when you're in high school and there's the captain of the football team and the, the female who's best dressed and everybody wants to be like them, that makes those people, you know, kind of think they're better than everybody else. But if you look around and say, no, you know what? These other animals are not trying to be like us. I think that realization will help make us a better people, better purse peoples in general. What, why is that important? It's important because we try to think that we're the stewards of this earth and that the earth belongs to us. And I think this data says we are an integral part of the biosphere and we belong to it, not the other way around. <laughs> Thank you. So humans, humans are unique just like every other species. And this picture, Carl Sagan got NASA Voyager spacecraft to turn around. No picture has ever been taken from further away. This is where we live. This is where every saint and sinner in the history of the universe, this is where every TEDx has occurred. <laughs> and he said, our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity and all this vastness, there's no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Thank you.